Brittany, this is not a democracy, it's a cheerocracy. Bring It On is, according to Roger Ebert, the Citizen Kane of cheerleader movies. That's true, not just because it's a classic in its genre, but also because it represents the fall of a towering but controversial figure. We're cheerleaders! We are cheerleaders! The pretty, blonde, all-American cheerleader has long been a key part of the fabric of the imagined or depicted high school, representing a feminine ideal for young women to live up to. I'm sexy! But 2000's underrated teen movie Bring It On subtly interrogated and took down our culture's deeply ingrained ideal of the cheerleader. It pointed out how our idea of this icon is shaped by white privilege. Our free cheer service is over as of this moment. And it challenged the character to become more, ultimately aiding her transformation in our popular consciousness from an empty-headed prize for a football player into a serious, driven, and creative athlete in her own right. We're the the best. We have fun, we work hard, and we win national championships. Here's our take on how Bring It On forever reframed the conversation on the cheerleader and where this figure is at now. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions of people come together to take classes that fuel their creative journey. The first 1,000 people to use the link in our description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So become a member today and start exploring your creativity for less than $10 a month. Cheerleading goes back to the 1800s, but women weren't allowed to cheer until the 1920s. In the decades that followed, women cheerleaders came to symbolize all-American femininity through an array of cliched on-screen portrayals. She's like a goddamn poster child for high school. These established the cheerleader as pretty. You're so pretty and funny and confident. Vapid. I love cheerleading. Is it just the lame outfits or do you like the brainless flitting around too? <gasps> Overtly sexual. Hello, daddy. Popular at the top of the high school hierarchy. Status is like currency. When your bank account is full, you can get away with doing just about anything. White and comfortably middle class. Right off the bat, the opening cheer of Bring It On dissects all the main elements of this cheerleader myth. I'm bitching. Great hair! The boys all love to stare! But this opening sequence turns out to be a dream that Kirsten Dunst's Torrance Shipman wakes up from. So it's as if the movie is saying that while this has been our collective dream of cheerleaders up to this point, I want it! The reality of cheerleading we're about to see after she wakes up is something very different. From there, Bring It On plays with and complicates cheerleader stereotypes as we meet female athletes who pursue excellence in their sport, who prize friendship and honor, and who learn to check their privilege. You pay our way in and you sleep better at night knowing how your whole world is based on one big old fat lie. Let's start with the cheerleader's looks. I'm pretty. Traditionally, the whole foundation of the cheerleaders' prestige and popularity is their beauty, which is used by schools or teams to embody a certain aspirational American brand of optimism and wholesomeness. Scholars Natalie Adams and Pamela Bettis describe cheerleading as a standard of ideal girlhood. You're a straight-A student. You're a cheerleader, for God's sakes. You're the perfect girl next door. Varsity.com says cheerleaders are a key marketing tool to the athletics programs that they support, and they create the community patriotism we call school spirit. Will we be seeing you at the trials this afternoon, Stacy? I wouldn't miss it. Well, that's good, because you are exactly the sort of girl we need to represent us. Blonde, dimpled, new Captain Torrance is this image to a T. It's only cheerleading. <laughs> I am only cheerleading. She's such an extension of the school spirit, even her name, Torrance, sounds similar to her sports team, the Toros. We are the Toros, the mighty, mighty Toros. Meanwhile, countering her apple pie appeal, the cheerleader is at the same time an erotic ideal, as evidenced by the large output of the adult entertainment industry featuring this character, and as acknowledged off the bat in Bring It On. I swear I'm not a whore! 
Professor Gary Bettinson's character framework of the classic high school movie includes the football jock, the slutty cheerleader, the ostracized loner, and the apathetic high school principal. Significantly though, that opening sequence when she dreams that she's naked in front of the school is the only time Bring It On overtly sexualizes Torrance, and she's horrified. <laughs> After that, the focus is on how the cheerleaders have to fight against their sport being pigeonholed as merely about sex appeal. Any sport that combines gymnastics, dance, and short skirts is okay by me. When these characters do use their sexuality, it's with agency, like when they exploit their bodies for a car wash to make money, or when Missy calls out her brother because his unthinkingly ogling the cheerleaders leads to him accidentally looking that way at her. What are you doing? making money from guys oogling my goodies. The classic cheerleader's symbolic role is typically to act as the hyper-feminine parallel to the aggressive jock. Be aggressive. Be aggressive. Her whole point is ostensibly to cheer on and prop up men, enabling school-based bro culture. And in many stories, this support extends to dating members of the football team. John and I belong together. He is the team captain, and I am the head cheerleader. Oh. But Bring It On undercuts the traditional heterosexual ideal of the male football player and the pretty cheerleader at his side with its running jokes that the Toros football team is terrible. All the cheerleaders in the world wouldn't help our football team. Man, it's just wrong. Cheering for them is just plain me. It elevates the cheerleader herself to a position of prime importance by making her a top-tier athlete competing at a national level. Ever been to a cheerleading competition? ESPN cameras all around, hundreds of people in the crowds cheering. Wait, people cheering cheerleaders? And when Torrance gets her happy romantic ending, she's nobody's prize. She kisses her crush. The film also reminds us that there are plenty of male cheerleaders who at this school are more accomplished than the football players. Just because we won more trophies than you guys, there's no reason to go get all malignant. Meanwhile, the loners of Bettinson's framework here can be or date cheerleaders too. So is that your band or something? The Clash? Another aspect of the cheerleader myth that Bring It On alludes to is how she's long been a controversial figure. I'm rockin', I smile, and many think I'm vile. Professor Emma Jane says that cheerleaders have long drawn intense vitriol from a range of ostensibly disparate social groups, including feminists, social conservatives, cultural elites, sports administrators and fans, mainstream media commentators, and members of the general public. The cheerleader is despised for not being feminist enough, but then for not being socially conservative enough. She pulls ace. That's not all she pulls. She's too much of an everywoman for some and far too elite for others. Torrance faces this misunderstanding even in her own home. Her parents are fairly nonplussed by her intensity about cheerleading. It kills me that you barely make time to study. If you studied half as much as you cheer, you'd be in great shape. And while not everyone gets it, to her, cheering is a superior extracurricular pursuit. And we can see that being the captain of this team seems pretty stressful. I hate to see you like this, all stressed out. Maybe you're just not captain material. The other way that Bring It On takes down the all-American cheerleader icon as we once knew her is through examining her white privilege. You guys are awesome. Really? Ready to share those trophies? While at first it may seem like your typical teen movie, Bring It On quickly becomes a parable about something much bigger, cultural appropriation. The success of Torrance's Toros as reigning national champions is built on a big wrong. The students of this wealthy white school have been stealing the original creations of a disadvantaged all-black squad. Miss Red snaked our routines from the East Compton Clovers. So with its central plot, the movie draws attention to the routine ways in which black culture, and particularly the intellectual property property of black women is co-opted by white people and repackaged to make it palatable for white audiences. Every time we get some, here y'all come trying to steal it, putting some blonde hair on it, and calling it something different. Torrance is devastated when she learns Big Red stole the cheers, but at first, she doesn't seem to grasp the gravity of this situation from a racial standpoint. She's looking at it more from an ethical one, and in a link back to the spoiled white cheerleader trope, focuses largely on how it affects her. My entire cheerleading career has been a lie. The black team, meanwhile, is very aware of the racial elements at play. Were the ethnic festivities to your liking today? 
There's also the sense that this has been going on for a long time. Y'all have been coming up here for years trying to steal our routines. And we just love seeing them on ESPN. And though her heart is in the right place, many of Torrance's subsequent interactions with the Clovers evidence her white guilt. White guilt, defined as the remorse felt by white people with regards to racial inequality, is a problematic response because, as Dr. Patrick Grzanka writes, white guilt retains a focus on the white subject, and thus it may offer limited potential to transform social relationships and systems of inequity. Torrance's sequence of behaviors after she learns of Big Red's transgression offers essentially a step-by-step -step primer of what not to do in situations like these. After she informs the other cheerleaders, her teammates argue that they should still be able to perform their stolen routine. We learned that routine fair and square. Don't punish the squad for Big Red's mistake. This is a recognizable kind of reasoning that white or privileged members of society might resort to when being confronted about inequality. The team members claim that as individuals, they didn't knowingly do anything wrong, so they don't feel they should be punished by having any of their privileges taken away from them. Changing the routine now would be total murder-suicide. How are East Compton going to prove anything? But these arguments overlook the truth that Torrance deep down intuits, that all of their successes are corrupted because they're built on an original sin. Arguably, the fact that they looked the other way and never questioned where Big Red got such creative routines is a central part of the wrong they engaged in, too. I know you didn't think a white girl made that up. Just as not being actively racist as an individual doesn't mean you don't profit from systemic racism. I hate racism. You don't have to deal with things like being racially profiled or getting unfairly turned down for a mortgage loan because of your skin color. As academics Kuwait and Taylor write of white guilt, we are all accomplices in a society that perpetuates past wrongs in the present day. At first, Torrance caves to the pressure to still perform the routine, but the story punishes this wrong decision with the public humiliation at their football game. Try to sell our bit, but you look like shit. We're the ones who are down with it. We were humiliated on our own turf. She then makes another classic wealthy white person mistake, trying to throw money at the problem. But after the choreographer she hires teaches them and five other teams a subpar routine, which leads to another incident of public shame. Apparently he's been peddling the same routine up and down the California coast. Six squads total. She learns that money alone can't buy quality creative output or excellence. Ultimately, Torrance's personal journey is about the inverse of appropriation, channeling her own creativity. Our whole cheering career, we've staked our reputation on being the best, the most inventive. Now we finally have a chance to truly be original? Things only start turning around for her once she looks inward to create an original artistic work that reflects her own experience and not someone else's. After her love interest Cliff writes her a song that speaks to her, she has the instinct to express her feelings through her own moves. Meanwhile, after getting nowhere by listening to others about what kind of captain she should be, she grasps that the key to being a leader is to trust yourself, to listen to your own gut, your moral compass, and your inner creative drive. And we've got less than three weeks till nationals. But if we can do it, if we can pull this off, then we can really call ourselves original. Just when she thinks she's got it figured out, though, Torrance has thrown another curveball. She discovers the Clovers won't be competing at nationals because they can't afford it. They couldn't raise the money in time. She's upset by the injustice and wants to take responsibility and help, but again, her white guilt leads her in the wrong direction. She leaps to fund them herself, running to, yes, her dad, to ask him to pay for it. They deserve to go. Do the right thing, Dad. Bring It On's director, Peyton Reed, said that in her mind, that's sort of her privileged white girl reaction, like, oh, I'm going to solve this thing. It's not that much money, Mr. Level Playing Field. Tell them the deal, maybe they'll want to help. Yet the Clover's captain, Isis, balks at what she sees as self-serving, guilt-driven charity. What is this, hush money? No. Oh, right, it's guilt money. In this exchange, the movie rejects its protagonist's attempt to be a white savior, a stage that often follows white guilt and offers a path for the white person to feel better. Why do you have to be so mean? I'm just trying to do the right thing here. 
But in Isis's view, this representative of an establishment that has exploited and stolen from her community shouldn't get to swoop in, offer a check that wasn't that hard for her to obtain, and get the satisfaction of viewing herself as a hero. You pay our way in and you sleep better at night knowing how your whole world is based on one big old fat lie. No matter how nice Torrance feels she's being, she's not an individual separate from this whole problematic larger context. And while Torrance is looking for a quick fix, the point is that there isn't an easy solution that will allow her to feel better. Torrance and the people she represents should feel uncomfortable about their part in racial inequality and dwell in that feeling. Isis wants the Clovers to make it to the Nationals on their own, and in her view, the right way to get the money for her team is from a successful former member of her neighborhood. It's not charity. Paulette Patton's from our neighborhood. She'll understand why we need the money. Torrance doesn't need to be anyone's savior. She just needs to acknowledge the Clovers for the superior athletes they are. You want to make it right? Then when you go to nationals, bring it. And show them the respect they deserve by competing her hardest against them. Don't slack off because you feel sorry for us. That way, when we beat you, we'll know it's because we're better. The final way that Bring It On unpacks the cheerleader is as a symbol of class, privilege, and wealth. One of the big reveals in Bring It On is the fact that although talent is important, it comes second to cash. It's so unfair. The first inner city squad ever to get a bid to nationals and they can't afford to go? The film shows Torrance's outrage that the Clover's raw talent isn't enough to get them to finals, and the audience might share that surprise, because it remains rare that a sports movie so openly confronts the capitalist nature of school athletics. He'll need three or four days to teach us the routine. But here's the thing, it's gonna cost us the fact is that cheerleading is inherently inequitable. These days, Hux Ruby Lot Lavinga says the cost of cheerleading can be between $750 to $3,500 a year. As a result, it's a massive industry estimated to be worth $2 billion. And in part, Bring It On is an analysis of the complex set of privileges that leads to a successful cheer career. But what Torrance realizes by the end of the movie is that only on a level playing field is any win even real. I define best as competing against the best there is out there and beating them. And this leads us to the movie's satisfying conclusion. A teen movie in that era could have easily decided it was an unbreakable rule that its protagonist must win the championship to get her happy ending. But Bring It On understands that it's a happier ending for Torrance's society if the best team wins. You guys were good. Thanks. You were better. We were, huh? while Torrance's close second got the right way is the victory for the protagonist. So, second place? How's it feel? Feels like first. Bring It On joined a few other teen movies at the turn of the millennium that gave the cliched cheerleader a second look. Varsity Blues looked at how this figure might be trapped into playing a cliche by her limited prospects. It's never about love. It's about me getting a better laugh. Gonna get out of West Canaan on your own. Smart. American Beauty presented a gorgeous cheerleader who's only pretending to be the knowing sexual ideal when in reality she's not only inexperienced but also at a loss for what might make her happy in life. What do you want? And But I'm a Cheerleader based its whole movie on subverting cultural expectations of this figure as a heterosexual ideal. I'm not perverted. I get good grades, I go to church. I'm a cheerleader! The early 2000s were a time when the world was rapidly changing for teens, who now had access to the internet and found new ways to articulate their feelings and frustrations. Bring It On and others showed high school not through its usual coding and fixed hierarchy, but as a fluid, more complicated place, where friendship, even between blonde head cheerleaders and the alternative outcasts, is prized. Thank God you're here this season, Missy. I couldn't have done it alone. It kickstarted a new genre of teen narratives in which the cheerleader isn't just the vapid girlfriend to a football player. She can be a person with agency, creativity, and even edge. She contains multitudes. You're Betty Cooper. Like Nancy Drew meets girl with the dragon tattoo. And while this movie is very much a white person's perspective on appropriation, Bring It On drew attention to important conversations about race in spaces where these were not yet commonplace. Ultimately, it's a lesson in how to look beyond the surface, how to evolve as we become more informed, and how to lose gracefully. Second place, hell yeah!
Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. I'm Deborah, and we're the creators of The Take. Please subscribe and tell us what you want our take on next. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community that offers affordable classes designed to fit your schedule and skill level. When you join Skillshare, you'll get access to workshops taught by amazing professionals, and you'll become part of a community of fellow creatives. One Skillshare original you can check out right now is King Arthur's class on audio mixing. All you need is a laptop and a basic set of headphones, and this class will teach you to mix tracks and achieve professional quality music. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey.